uh, I have given talks in the past where I carry with me a 70-page tightly printed list and it shows 2,000 auto companies. Now, if at the start of the 20th century, you had seen what the auto was going to do to this country, the impact it would have on the lives of you, then your children and grandchildren and so on, that what, it just it transformed the American landscape. But if those 2,000 companies, you know, three basically survive, and they haven't done that well uh, at, at many times. So how do you pick three winners out of 2,000. I mean, it's not so easy to do. It's easy when you look back, but it's not so easy looking forward. So you could have been dead right on, on the fact that the auto industry, in fact, you probably couldn't have predicted how big an impact it would have. But you wouldn't have, if, you, if you'd bought companies across the board, you wouldn't have made any money because the economic characteristics of that business were not easy to define. Um, I said, I, I've always said the easier thing to do is figure out who loses. And what you really should have done in 1905 or so, when you saw what was going to happen with the auto, is you should have gone short horses. There were 20 million horses in 1900, and there's about 4 million horses now. So it's easy to figure out the losers. You know, the loser is the horse. But the winner was the auto overall. But 2,000 companies just about failed. A few merged out and so on. Uh, there were three companies, auto companies, in the Dow Industrials in the 1920s and 30s. Studebaker, Nash Calvinator, and Hudson Motor. Now those names are all familiar to me, and maybe some of them are familiar to you, but they're not making any cars. You know, they didn't make money, and yet at one time, they were in the Dow 30. They were the aristocrats of American business, and they got creamed. So figuring out the economic characteristics of a, the winners in a wonderful business are, is not easy. In North Carolina, you know, Orville and Wilbur took off, or I guess Orville took off and Wilbur watched. I'd have been Wilbur. Uh, <laughs> but if you could have seen the future of the airline business from that point forward and how that would transform things, you know, it would, it would have blown you away. And it's excited people, incidentally, ever since. But if there had been a capitalist at Kitty Hawk, he should have shot Orville down. I mean, it, uh, because it's done nothing but cost investors money. There were over 400 airplane companies in the 1920s and 30s alone. There was an Omaha. There was a Nebraska. We were the Silicon Valley, of, of, apparently, of aircraft. And they all disappeared. It's been a terrible business. At the end of 1991, if you'd added up the aggregate earnings from all airline companies with billions poured in, since Wilbur and Orville were down there, they came to less than zero. The number of passengers went up every year. You know, the importance of the industry was dramatically increased decade by decade, and nobody made any money. It, uh, so figuring out the economic consequences, TV, I think there's, I don't know, 20, 25 million sets a year sold in the United States. I don't think there's one of them made in the United States anymore. I mean, you'd say TV set manufacturer, what a wonderful business. I mean, everybody, now nobody had a TV in 1950, or thereabouts, 45 to 50. Everybody has multiple sets now. Nobody is in the United States has made any real money making the sense that they're all out of business. You know, the Magna Boxes, the RCAs, all of those companies. Radio was the equivalent of the 20, over 500 companies making radios in the 1920s. Again, I don't think there's a, a U.S. radio manufacturer at the present time. But Coca-Cola, you know, what was it, 1884, at Jacob's Pharmacy or whatever, the fellow comes up with something. A lot of co copiers over the years. But now you've got a company that is selling roughly 1.1 billion eight ounce servings of its product, not all Coke, Sprite, and some others, daily throughout the world 117 years later. So understanding the economic characteristics of a business is different than predicting the fact that an industry is going to do wonderfully. And so when I look at the internet businesses or I look at tech businesses, I say this is a marvelous thing and I love to play around on the computer and. It, now I order my books from Amazon and all kinds of things, but I don't know who's going to win. And unless I know who's going to win, I'm not interested in investing. I'll just play around on the computer. And uh, uh, <laughs> Defining your circle of competence is the most important aspect of investing. It's not how important, uh, how, how large your circle is. You don't have to be an expert on everything. 
But knowing where the perimeter of that circle of what you know and what you don't know is, and staying inside of it, is all important. Tom Watson Sr., who started IBM, said in his book, he said, I'm no genius, he said, but I'm smart in spots, and I stay around those spots. And, and you know, that is the key. Uh, so if I understand a few things, and I stick in that arena, I'll do okay. And if I don't understand something, but I get all excited about it because my neighbors are talking about it, and the stocks are going up and everything, they start fooling around someplace else, eventually I'll get cream, and I should. So now let's go over here.